<clears throat> Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining so far. We're just waiting a couple more minutes before we're going to start. Um, we've got quite a couple of people who, who registered, so just waiting for everyone to join. Okay, before wasting too much time, I think uh, let's kick off. Uh, there will be more people joining as the session progresses. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Darby Carstens and I sit in the business development team of Prescient. I'll quickly run through the agenda and then I'll hand over to Eng to give us a more detailed update on income provider over the last quarter. Um, so just to set the scene, uh, as already said there, uh, I'll do the uh, the quick overview of our funds. Um, so for income provider, I think it's uh, important to remember what we try and achieve with the fund. Um, obviously, risk management is first and foremost for us. We try not to lose capital and thereafter we try and give clients inflation plus targeting sort of inflation plus three over the long term. If you look at this graph, um, the blue <coughs> line is provider, the green line is the multi-asset high equity uh, sector, the, the light green line is, ach, light um, gray line is the multi-asset medium equity, and then the yellow is multi-asset low equity. Um, so obviously through consistency, over the last 15 years, we've outperformed all the, the averages of the sector. Um, and I think that's just by managing risk within the fund. So if you move on a slide, Hink. Um, everyone knows us for the fixed income space, and I thought just to spend a couple of more minutes on, on our other fixed income and cash solutions that we've got. So we've recently launched the corporate money market <laughs> GCR double uh, A. The yield of the corporate money market is slightly lower than our normal money market because we are restricting the, the assets that we can hold within that even more. Uh, the step up from that is up, obviously our money market, a little bit more open, but still very, very restricted. Um, the, the fund above money market on the next slide will be yield one plus. Just pause on this slide for a moment. I uh, think if you can go one back. So yield quant plus is a step up from money market. I'll talk about that in a moment. Just uh, on optimized income, the yield looks very attractive on this slide. And I just want to clarify that it's the pre-tax equivalent yield. So that is what a money market fund would need to generate in order to, to get a yield uh, equal to optimized income after tax. Uh, if we move on to the next slide then, yield quant plus, uh, still a very, very safe fund <coughs> price that one rand. And then from then on, we go into our other fixed income funds. Another fund that we launched earlier in the yield is Income Plus. That's a more credit focused fund. It's credit has been a sort of flavor of the month for the last couple of years. 
generating very, very good yields, although um, it's it's definitely more risky than our income provider fund that Henk will talk about today. So without taking up more time, I'll now hand over to Henk. Thanks, Henk. Henk, you must just unmute yourself. Seems we're having a small technical issue here. We're just figuring, figuring out how to unmute Inc. I think we'll be online soon. Uh, we're just um, struggling to unmute him for some reason, although the IT team is here to help. So just uh, bear with us. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Online. Go ahead. Perfect. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to start again. Um, I've almost gone through the whole presentation and I realize you can't hear me. Um, I do apologize for the IT gremlins. We are also experiencing load shedding, so uh, bear with us when the power does come on and we uh, experience some more IT issues. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's obviously fantastic to have a uh, big audience. <clears throat> I would have loved to come and see everyone, every one of you in person and get the opportunity to again travel our beautiful country. Um, you know, it is a beautiful country and unfortunately I think we all are, you know, in, uh, from a more or less extent, um, <clears throat> not feeling all that fantastic about it, um, where the light at the end of the tunnel seems to be more a train than the sun at this point in time. Uh, but luckily from, you know, from the asset management perspective, and there are still some fantastic returns to be had. And the markets rebounded quite well. Um, and I'm just going to spend some time today just to take you through what we've seen, how the funds performed, and um, how we position to capture you know, this real returns we still can generate in our market um, going forward. So just to touch on performance, <clears throat> this is over the last quarter, you can see a very strong rebound since um, after the first quarter where we saw obviously a lot of market stress. Uh, but what's more important for us is obviously the inflation beating returns over time. So what happened in March? <clears throat> I just want to start with that, set the scene um, and really build from that. Um, and so, so apologies to some of you who've seen this before, but um, you know what we saw happen during March was really a, a liquidity crisis and a liquidity at all costs, we call it. Um, you know, similar to, to you managing your own money, putting it a 30 day, uh, day deposit, um, and something unforeseen happens and you know within 15 days people call that uh, you don't have the liquidity to pay them back and you need to create the liquidity at all costs and you're selling assets um, at levels where you really shouldn't be selling them. Um, you know, in, in central banks to try and support this system 
um, and we've seen what happened subsequent to that. Um, in the SA bond market, obviously very liquid market, we saw the same stress as people sold bonds um, to generate this liquidity and at one point during March, uh, the bond market was down more than the equity market. We saw some form of QE in South Africa where you know, the central bank stepped in and bought some bonds, not nearly to the same extent as the global market, but still um, you know, some relief to the market. Really what that does is to tell the banks and the market that there is a buy of large resort and we've seen some normality return to the markets. Um, during March, we saw some stress in the money markets as well. Uh, this is a very dangerous thing to see. Uh, luckily, our Reserve Bank is very well um, you know, equipped to, to deal with this. They understand the market quite well. Uh, the interbank bank market and they eased up that liquidity squeeze. We saw that quite quickly, um, you know, one by regulatory relief and two by this liquidity injection. Uh, they also cut interest rates by two and a half percent. Um, and if you look at what the market's pricing in our view is that potentially they will cut more. So to look at some slides as to what um, this Kiwi looked like or this response by central banks to really get the markets back from the abyss. This is the US uh, interest rates or you know what the market looks at uh, for US interest rates going forward. And you can see how that's been slashed to close to zero. And uh, what's more important for us is to look at is to look at the projection of where the market expects rates to go for the US. And you can see uh, not a lot of expectation for rates to go higher. Um, and we tend to agree with that view. Then if you look at what the Fed did in terms of buying treasury, so really quantitative easing where they print money and buy assets. Um, here they're buying their own bonds. And you can see we compare it to the previous three times they've done this, um, how quickly it's so over the velocity of how, how quickly they've done this. Um, and the magnitude, how much they've bought. Um, that's important if you look at the next slide. So what we're looking at here is really the percentage change in the assets of the Federal Reserve versus the S&P 500 return. And you can see uh, that strong correlation really um, where the, you know, the quip comes from, from one of the big asset managers globally is they've really now only, they only buy what the Fed buys. Then to try and explain why this is a bit of a problem for us is, is looking at this chart. Um, it looks a little bit technical, but what we've done here is to, let, to take um, S&P 500 returns, so quarterly returns from 1990, um, and compare that to the quarterly uh, GDP number for that quarter. So you can see the blue dots, <clears throat> some correlation between growth and equity returns, um, and then the red dot now, which is a extremely interesting uh, dot to look at. Obviously, that's the estimate for this quarter, um, but you can see that dislocation from how the markets had reformed or performed and what we see happen to the economy. And for us, this is creating a lot of risk, and I'm going to show you how we deal with that a bit later. Then looking at the South African market, uh, this is looking at our forward rate agreements or what the market expects for South African interest rates. And really what you can see is the same picture as what we saw in the US, uh, where the central or our central bank or the reserve bank cut rates by two and a half percent. But again, as I said, the most important thing about this chart is to look at the projection for rates. And really, we see rates remaining around zero or at least around three and a half to four percent in South Africa for the foreseeable future. This thing creates the problem that in South Africa, we've seen a lot of positive real rates uh, for you know three, four, five years. And potentially now going into next year with rates remaining low and inflation coming off a low base, uh, inflation today at 2.1%, so obviously very low, expecting this base to grow, um, you could see regular real rates next year. For us, that's a, a bit of a headache. Um, the philosophy of the present income provider fund is obviously an absolute return mindset. So we, what we mean by that is we uh, seek to maximize our real return, so inflation beating return. Um, and then well-managed risk, as Davi alluded to earlier. Um, the focus really being on risk management and generating real returns. So we focus on real returns and not on peer returns. And now with this real rate being negative going into next year, what can we do to generate uh, real returns? And so to show you over calendar years how we've done that, uh, you can see the focus on gross real returns over time, a very strong focus of doing inflation plus um, every year. So what tools do we have? And I've listed them here. Uh, we have the ability in the multi-asset income space to use different tools and to asset allocate um, to assets that not necessarily linked to cash. So we see cash as the risk at this point in time uh, if you want to generate real returns. But we have the ability to use these tools to then generate this real return. Um, the first one I've listed here is the offshore component. 
Um, here, really, what we do is we try and look for South African counterparties in the offshore market where they have dollar bonds. I've got a slide to explain that a little later. And really, what we've seen is a very attractive yields for South African counterparties in the offshore market. Um, and if you hedge out the currency risk, uh, you're getting an additional interest rate pickup there, generating a really good return uh, for the fund. Second one is duration. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, with the stress in the bond market, um, yields going higher, there's a lot of value in South African bonds, a lot of risk as well. I'll show you what, what we see as some of the risks, um, but really adding duration to portfolios at the right levels with the right risk um, really gives you a very good real return. Third one I've listed here is preference shares, a very good asset class for us, um, one we like a lot. We think that um, the market might have a bit of a misconception around preference shares. We saw them also get hit quite hard in March. They haven't rebounded to the same extent the rest of the market has, and we think there's a, you know, they've been painted by the same brush of the Reserve Bank um, the directive that they, you know, asked the banks to maybe look at cutting ordinary share dividends. Um, preference shares also got hit. So just to explain where the preference shares sit within the capital stack of a bank, the first thing that the bank would cut is the executive prof uh, bonuses. The second thing they would look at is the ordinary share dividends. They will then go into what we call additional tier one coupons. So that's really subordinated debt uh, interest payments. Then addition, uh, tier two, which is also subordinated debt coupon payments, and then only does pref preference share dividends come into play. So really um, uh, a long way before we get to preference share dividends uh, being at risk. So great asset for us as an income fund. The fourth one is the inflation linked bonds. Um, it's one we like a lot. If you think our mindset is of inflation plus returns, Buying an inflation linked bonds does that for us. Again, moving away from cash risk, inflation plus three, what we can currently earn in the government three year space, um, a lot of you know, risk free, enough liquidity, inflation plus three. We should really be only be buying that and um, seeing you guys again in three years' time. Then the last one is property. Uh, you know, obviously, also got hit quite hard during March, a uh, bit of a sensitive one. We were defensive in our property exposure going into March. We still remain defensive. We haven't cut our exposure. Uh, we do think there's value that will emerge eventually um, for us to increase that exposure again. Uh, but a lot of uncertainty around REIT payout ratios, um, you know, valuation of the properties underlying and what that could do to covenants on, on some of the debt. Um, so we just need to see some certainty before we, we can pull the trigger and again uh, start investing into property. If you think about property in the long run, it's a fantastic asset for an income fund. You know, building costs goes up with inflation, so really your assets should grow with inflation and whatever they pay you on top of that uh, is inflation plus. So just to explain what I've just gone through um, in a little bit more detail, so looking at the offshore piece, uh, as an example, what we can do in the local market is buy first rand bonds at 6.5% in rands. If I then go into the offshore space and buy the exact same bond in terms of credit quality and term, um, I get that bond at the moment at 6% in dollars. If I then hedge out the currency, so I sell the dollars and I buy rand so that I don't have the currency exposure in the fund, I get an additional 3.5% pickup at the moment. Um, that then effectively creates in the portfolio 9.5% asset for first rand versus the 6.5% asset in the local market. Why is that premium there? The offshore market trades South Africa and South African names in the same way, they see them as the same risk. Um, and when you see sell-offs in emerging markets in the offshore space, you see our yields move wider. For us, that's an opportunity and one we have implemented in the fund. So we haven't increased the offshore exposure in the fund. What we've done is changed the composition of the offshore component of the fund by including these assets. The next one, what I've shown you here is the duration. So what I want to try and show you is the fantastic returns that you can see from the bond market. Um, in the blue line is the total return in one year's time for the different bonds over the tenor. Um, we've done then some stress scenarios, so if yields had to move down 1%, what you can expect for one year total return, yields go up 1%, that's the red line, um, and then we've just tweaked the curve a bit with the yellow line. But what this chart really shows us is the extreme value that we see in our bond market. Um, obviously, with the different risk mindsets um, and the different risk appetites, you need to pick your tenor. For us in the income space, we are, you know, we don't want too much volatility of return, so we focus on the front end of the bond curve around really the seven-year area. Um, again, a lot of value around 10%. 
Um, but there is there's, there's risks, and we need to be able to, you know, to identify those and be you know, in the position to manage these risks. So what do we see as the main risk here? Um, I alluded to our beautiful country earlier to, in, in, in the talk, um, but really we all understand that the, you know, we, have, we face a lot of mountains um, and a lot of risks in South Africa. And this one really stands out for us as one of the main ones. So what we're looking at here is the gross debt to GDP um, for, for, for Treasury. Uh, in the blue line was the 2019 budget. Um, the red line was the 2020 budget. And then the two green lines was the now published revised budget in June of this year. And uh, what's interesting to see from the blue to the red line is how they shorten the forecast as the outlook becomes all the more uncertain. Um, but what really is interesting for us is that um, the difference between what they now call the active and the passive scenario. So really the passive scenario that the finance minister put on the table is if nothing had to change, um, that's the profile of debt for us. And that's scary if you look at uh, from 2019, 2023, so blue line in 2023 to where we are now, debt really is almost double. Um, and that's an extreme number. That's a problem for us as a country. If we had growth and low interest rates, we could fund this. Obviously, we know we don't have the growth and our interest rates are very high. So this becomes unsustainable. And as a bondholder, you know, more issuance to try and fund this, the more supply there is, obviously bond yields become under pressure. Um, you know, this, these are the kind of risks you need to look out for when investing into the bonds. Yes, there's great value, um, but just be cognizant of the risk that you're investing into. Then on the preference shares, what we've done here um, to explain this chart is to show you the difference between the average of the preference share yield. So in our fund, we focus on the top four banks and uh, where we see enough liquidity um, and the cash rate. So as I said earlier, our focus is on moving away from cash linked assets to generate our inflation plus return with the negative real return we see in cash. Um, and this is for us a great asset. You can see the value, um, a lot of value in buying press for us. Focus on the top four bank risk enough liquidity and fantastic yields. So to sum all of that up, uh, this is the current asset allocation of income provider fund as of the end of June. You can see a very good mix of assets, uh, focus on assets away from cash, um, really generating us that inflation plus return. And we still remain confident that this year we again will meet that plus three target that we, we set out to achieve. So we've got this asset allocation I've done I've taken you through the, the tools we have. Um, we are generating inflation, inflation plus returns. We saw what happened in March. The markets rebounded quite strongly, um, even be it with a lot of drugs that the central banks gave it. So we see there is now again a border of risk. And it's very important for us to, to again now manage this risk. So the way we've gone about it is to try and identify the risk assets in the portfolio. Um, we've looked through the portfolio. As I said earlier, we think preference shares hasn't really rebounded to the same extent that the rest, the rest of the portfolio has. Property is a small exposure, so those two we've parked for now. And we've said the offshore really and the duration pieces in the portfolio is where we see the risk. Um, and during June, we looked at this and said, okay, both of these have run hard. Um, we still want to be invested. Uh, they are earning us great yields, but we want to add some protection. Um, and we've done this via options. So both on the offshore side, we've added some currency options to protect the portfolio. If you know, if we see another sp uh, a blow off in markets, um, these options will protect the portfolio and definitely protect the offshore component. Um, and the second one is the duration where we have, we have the fixed bonds. If these risks materialize and we see yields moving again higher, this option would then protect the portfolio. And really what we're doing here is paying for some protection. It's very cost effective. Um, creating ease of mind, uh, peace of mind, um, and really what we like to call it is asymmetric return profiles. To, expl to explain that a bit better is to show you this chart. So this shows you the more money we make, the more in we enjoy it, the more money we lose, the more pain we feel. We should all know that. But in reality, that is what happens. The more money we make, the less we enjoy it, and the more money we lose, the greater the pain. So what we try and achieve um, with adding these risk management tools is the green line. So we want to participate and be fully invested, um, but protect the downside. And that's what we do and what we say when we truly manage risk is asset allocate to generate real returns, but be very cognizant of the risk and where you see those um, add strategies to protect the portfolio for when risk materializes.
I want to spend some time and just share some thoughts around credit. Um, it's a topic in our market that's been talked about, um, you know, broadly. Uh, those of you who've seen me in the last two years would know that we've been defensive on credit. We think that credit markets are expensive and were expensive. Um, and really what I wanted to try and show you today is that, you know, the work we do in the portfolio to try and uh, position the fund to be defensive in a market where we see credit as expensive. Um, and this chart really has a lot of detail on it, but really what we're showing is that we take exposure to quality names. That's one of the defensive qualities of the portfolio. But the second one um, and the more important one for us is where that red arrow is pointing towards. That really is the weighted average term of quality defenses. Do that. Um, the weighted average term of the portfolio. So the average of the maturities of the instruments we hold is one and a half years. And that's important because of the next slide. So what we've done here, this needs a bit more explaining, is to take the bank funding curve. So that's the blue line. So really, bank funding curve is the start of all credit markets. Um, and to show you that curve over the different terms at the bottom. So the term is how long the instrument has to until it matures or until you get your money back. It's very important to distinguish between term and duration. Duration is interest rate risk. So if you have duration and interest rates move, then the portfolio is at risk. Term risk is the price of credit. So the spread that you earn, um, if that moves, you are exposed to term risk. So what we're looking at here is term. So from five years to one year in the blue line is the current curve. The green dot is where we positioned. And what we're trying to show you is what the effect of the roll down of the curve. So being defensively positioned, the front end of this curve gives us protection um, if you move this thing into the red line, which is one year forward. So in one year, in one year's time, the projection is for the yields or the spreads, the price of the credit we own to be 40 points lower. So we benefit that 40 points. If then your portfolio was rather in the five year term, um, you can see there's very little benefit in one year's time. So if your portfolio was five years and the, the price or the spread moves by 1%, you, your portfolio will lose 5%. Um, in one year's time, there's not much benefit from gaining back any of, any of the money you've lost. Con contrast that to the one, the one and a half year or the 1.56 year area. If the one, uh, this price of the credit moves 1%, you lose one and a half percent, but we have that additional 50 basis points of roll down. So only losing 1% in the portfolio. So you can see the defensive nature of being positioned in the front end of the curve. Um, where credit spreads could potentially move wider uh, in the back end. Okay, the second part of this is obviously that we've seen spreads move. Um, so what are we looking at here is the bank spreads uh, for senior and green, for tier two or subordinated debt in red, and then additional tier one, which is a little bit further down the credit spectrum for banks as well in blue. Um, and this is important because the, this means that the assets we own in the portfolio has already repriced. So we're sitting with high quality, shorter term assets that's already been marked up. Um, if your portfolio was positioned in five year assets of corporate names that hasn't moved, there's some pricing risk for us. So high quality, shorter term, with, you know, that creates liquidity. The liquidity has seen the spreads move. It's already in our price. Just to end off, I wanted to spend some time and talk about SOEs. Obviously, land bank is a critical issue. Um, for us, it's important to understand that not all SOEs are the same. And you know, you have to uh, differentiate between the different SOEs. Um, so I've listed the table here, some of the names that we credit negative on, ESCOM, Danel, um, SAA and SABC, um, and some of the, the ones we have exposure to, which we think are fantastic counterparties and where we're getting paid for taking um, on that counterparty risk. So the risk reward for us there is uh, in our favor. Those are IDC, DBSA, which is the relevant bank of South Africa, Transnet, and then obviously Land Bank. Um, just to spend some time on Land Bank, I've got a slide. So what happened with Land Bank was a liquidity crisis. Um, my analogy earlier about the fixed term deposit, if you put your money away for 30, month, uh, 30 days, um, and it's for some unforeseen reason, 15 days in, someone needs you to, to pay them back and you can't, you have the money, but just not now. That's more or less what happened. So with the downgrade of the sovereign or South Africa, um, some of the international creditors to land bank 
weren't able to roll their facilities because of the credit quality. Um, that unforeseen circumstance led to them not being able to meet um, you know, debt payments that was upcoming. So a liquidity crisis, not a solvency crisis. Land Bank is a going concern, um, it made profit last year, it keeps, you know, it keeps making profits for us as a good asset. Um, you know, the second point to this is National Treasury obviously coming out uh, very firmly to say they'll do whatever it takes to support the Land Bank. Um, and we saw the commitment from the Finance Minister um, in the budget with the additional 3 billion Rand uh, capital that they've, that they've given the Land Bank. Um, we are privy to, to the discussions with Land Bank um, as holders of Land Bank. So the, what we see now is a three-step plan uh, to, to rectify the current situation. So the first part of this plan is what we call the liquidity injection, and that really is the three billion that we saw from the budget. Um, this will then uh, get, get given to uh, Land Bank to cure all the defaults. So what do I mean by, by that? Um, is pay back all outstanding interest um, and capital that was you know, due in the last two months and really create some operational uh, liquidity for them to start operating again. The second part of this plan is the restructuring blueprint um, that's, been by, that's been driven by RMB as a corporate advisor. And really what they're doing there is to manage the liabilities of the land banks so that they be, it's a more sustainable balance sheet. Um, so if they have X amount of debt within the next year, restructure that to make sure that over the next three years, uh, that profile is a much, uh, you know, much more sustainable. And then the final one is, the, is another equity injection by the shareholder, which is National Treasury. Um, and that really is just to make sure that Land Bank um, is a going concern going forward. 30% of all um, agricultural loads in South Africa comes from the Land Bank. Um, it really is a good entity, uh, mismanaged liquidity and unforeseen circumstances as less to this. If you look at the exposure we have in the income provider fund is less than 1.3%. Um, it's in the form of a bilateral loan. Uh, what does that mean? Again, we have strong covenants. It's not a listed in, uh, bond that we, we buy in the market. It's something we structure with them ourselves. It gives us a lot of comfort and protection. Um, and the yields on this on this note is very, very attractive. So it's an asset we like and one we would like to keep in the portfolio. So what's the frustration with all of this? For us, there was, it was an easy fix. Um, you know, our view is that if this happened in America, the Federal Reserve would have fixed this in one day. They would have seen the crisis that is one of liquidity, and they would have sorted that out. Um, we needed a firm and you know, firm stance and quick action by the Treasury um, to sort this out, and that wasn't forthcoming. It's been a process, um, but I think maybe we can cut them some slack given the you know pandemic that's running around and all the fires that they are trying to put out. You know, the additional risk that this, this has created for SOEs is obviously a funding risk. Um, you know, the market now um, think twice before funding SOEs. And again, for, back to my previous slide, um, it's very important to just differentiate between the different SOEs. We like the ones that I've shown you and highlighted. We think they create going concerns. Um, you're getting paid for the risk you're taking. Um, and there's some other ones you need to be, be wary of. Just in concluding, um, asset allocation is very key in the current environment where real, retail, real rates are going into negative territory. Um, we do have the tools. We are using them to generate inflation plus target. Um, it's very important to then risk manage around asset allocating to these um, as all these assets introduce risk. Um, I've shown you what the effect of the stimulus is on the market. We think that there's a big dislocation and the risk of a second wave or another March has increased for us. Um, and for that reason, we've put in place our risk management tools um, to truly manage that risk and create that asymmetric return profile. And really what that does is create peace of mind and it meets our client objectives. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm now happy to take the questions. Thank you, Inc. There's uh, quite a couple of questions that has come through already. Um, I see some of them are quite similar to others, so I'll, I'll try and get to all of them, but uh, let's see if we've got enough time. <laughs> so the first one, um, unfortunately, it's from Anonymous, but um, views on government proposal of prescribed assets. Is there any traction there? Clients are quite worried about being forced to fund government's corrupt endeavors and SOEs. Yes, that's a very good question, and thank you to Anonymous. Um, so. We don't think that prescribed assets in the form that we used to know them 
is really on the cards. What we do think could potentially happen um, is some form of infrastructure bond um, where you know the proceeds of that bond would be um, you know, allocated a lot more transparently. Um, if that's the case, then potentially it's something that could work. Um, but I agree that where it's a blanket prescribed asset forcing us to buy bonds that we don't think there's any value, and there would be a lot of pushback from, from asset managers. Um, so we think it's highly unlikely to see prescribed assets in the latter format, and potentially some form of infrastructure bond where um, you know there's a lot more transparency and potentially a third party managing the, the assets um, could work. Um, but we'll have to wait and see what the details are around those. But as I said, I think you know prescribed assets as as we used to know them, um, forcing us to buy things that we don't want to uh, is unlikely for us. Um, and then a second one, taking the current economic situation into account, how much income and I guess how much bonds would you recommend in a client's portfolio? So tough one for you, but. Maybe take it back to the, the fund when we buy bonds and buy income. Yeah, that, that is a tricky one. Obviously, it, it, it depends on the risk um, appetite of the client. Um, so as I said on the bond curve, there's a lot of value. Um, so I would definitely have some bonds. Um, just be cognizant of the volatility that there is in bond markets. Obviously, the market has come back quite strongly. There's a lot of risk in, in SA and globally. Um, and we could see could see some volatility creeping in. Why would why do we buy bonds? Um, you know, it's to protect ourselves against inflation, so get inflation plus. So really, if you if you see inflation running wild, then bonds shouldn't be part of your portfolio. Um, we don't think for inflation goes north of six or seven percent. Um, so bonds remain a good good asset for us. But again, it's it's a risk appetite thing. So we like the seven year area for the income fund. We think there's enough. Uh, enough fat there with uh, less volatility. Um, where clients can stomach a bit more, then you know bond funds are a great option. You know there's returns of or yields north of 11%, um, but you know a good good mix of the two I think is a good good idea. Um, you know exact mix will depend on the risk appetite. Uh, the next one may be a bit technical again, um, or just a technicality issue. How do you compare monthly returns to SA CPI, given that CPI is released with a one month lag? Um, not quite sure I understand the question. So, I mean, we obviously then will compare the month the same month. So if June comes out, we have a number for June. We can compare our June return to that CPI number for that June month. June month. Um, so, you know, when we show inflation numbers, we won't show, we can't show this one now. So we'll show we just saw uh, the May print come out. So we can show our May to the May print. So that's why I think I'm answering your question. I'm not quite sure um, if that's correct. I think that answers it, JD, if, if you need more clarification, just post the question again. Um, uh, views on financial versus non-financial corporate debt. Uh, do you have strong views? I, th I think we've um, been quite clear in the past that we we have strong views on corporate debt. Yes, so as I uh, alluded to that, so if you look at financial versus non-financial, financial debt is deemed more uh, of a higher quality. Um, and we've seen the better quality names trade. So if bonds or corporate paper trades for financial corporate trade, uh, the price will move. And we've seen that. I showed you the chart of the spreads already moving wider for the financial corporates. So we're comfortable with those. Um, you know, they're reflecting the increased risk that we are seeing in the in the economy. Um, obviously, their balance sheets being a bit under pressure. You know, we need to be paid more for taking their credit, and the market has priced there. Um, where there's non-financial corporates. Um, you know, there's a lot more sticky. It's not liquid enough. Uh, there we see a lot of risk of repricing. Um, so, you know, we'd be very wary of getting into non-financial corporates that hasn't traded in a while. We think the spreads need to be a lot wider before we get into those. Um, so I think it's important to focus on liquidity, high quality, and as I said, shorter term credit at this point in time. And differentiating between the two financial versus non-financial, Financial, we see price discovery as a lot clearer. There's transparency and liquidity versus non-financial, where we haven't seen a lot of trade. 
Um, I think maybe just to bring that back to sort of what a client would feel if non-financial spread starts widening. Yeah, so as I alluded to earlier on the term, it's very important to understand the term risk in a portfolio. Um, so not talking about duration or interest rate risk, but term risk. So, you know, when does this asset mature? If your portfolio has an average term of five years and spreads in the non-financial sector moves 2%, those five-year term assets will be down 10% on, from a capital perspective. So you will take that hit. And so it's very un important to understand the spread risk in portfolios um, compared to when, when, where you are positioned on the term curve. So as I said, we focus on shorter term. Uh, it's a defensive play where we think that spread should be widening in our market given where you know, fundamentals are. Um, the impact on insurance companies and the guarantees, uh, the guaranteed annuities they have issued um, from SA government uh, bonds. So, what happens to the the insurance companies if SA government bonds defaults? Um, that's a good question. So, my view on government bonds defaulting is that I don't think that happens. So, South Africa is in the uh, fortunate position that we don't have a lot of dollar debt or offshore debt. Um, so that really means that where we can't pay our debts um, and the default position comes up, we can really print money and pay back the debt. So, you know, company, if you look at countries going back, um, that's default, it's really come, uh, countries with a lot of offshore debt where they get forced to, to, to pay back um, debt where they can't, where con countries with a lot of uh, local debt, they can uh, really print and pay. So they, I think it's very, very, very unlikely that the government defaults on their debt. Um, in terms of the insurance companies, uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think you know the risk of government default is uh, very, very low. And then um, one relating to that crystal ball you keep in your bag. Over the next six months, is there another market drop due due to COVID? Yeah, so we don't forecast that my crystal ball <clears throat> is pretty black, but the you know, I think what we are seeing is a lot of risks in the market and a build up of risk. And we do think that um, you need to be to be positioned for a potential um, you know, market event again uh, due to you know, a number of reasons. It could be South Africa specific um, or it could be due to a second wave. Um, but I think we haven't seen quite, we haven't really seen the economic impact of, of COVID-19 yet. Um, and we, we would expect um, the market to start reflecting that again. Um, then one relating directly on land bank and, and maybe not to the fund specifically, but are farmers with land bank loans at risk? I think you've more or less covered it, but just give your view. I think if you if you have a loan from the land bank as a farmer, you're fine. Um, you know, they need to come get the money from you. Um, if you had a deposit with the land bank, it's our understanding that land bank has meet, you know, met all uh, the withdrawals from the farmers, so you know the farmers have been well looked after. Um, this liquidity injection will obviously also rectify that position. It's very, very important for all of us that the land bank keeps keeps going. Um, and I have to, you know, we have been privy to a lot of the discussions. We are sitting on the committees, etc., um, and the discussions are very constructive. Um, we have to take our hat off to how, you know, as I said, the frustration is, is it's been slow. Um, but now that they've come to party, it's, um, they are doing doing good work there. So, you know, we do foresee a solution quite soon. Um, but as I said, I think the farmers have been well looked after in this, in this scenario. Thank you. Um, your views on ILBs? Yeah, I think we, as I alluded to earlier, it's one of the building blocks we like. It's a very good asset class, specifically in uncertain times like we are now. Um, they will pay you inflation plus what you are earning. So if inflation is 100, you're earning 100 plus 3 is an example of the assets we own. Um, and an income fund, we'll be trying to generate inflation plus returns. Obviously, they are a great asset class. You know, some of the risk around them, obviously what we're seeing now with inflation today, 2.1%, um, you have a negative carry. So the interest that you're earning month on month um, is lower than cash. Um, but you do can compensate for that over the life of the of the bond that you own. And um, then there's always this misconception of illiquidity in that market. 
uh, where we participate in the market, we do see enough liquidity. Um, we also see that the increase in bond issuance or inflation in bond issuance um, generates more liquidity as there's more supply. Um, so, I mean, our view is that it's a great asset class, um, maybe a bit neglected, um, and one we do expect to to come to, you know, to the fore again. Um, if you look at the back end, so longer term inflation in bonds, so 2050s um, out, you know, there's obviously a lot of new duration risk there, but for us, you can get inflation plus five. Um, you know, that's more or less what equity should give you, and if you can tell me risk-free equities will give you inflation plus five for that tenor, um, you know, I'd love to hear your arguments, but, you know, I think it's a building block that you need to have in, in, in your funds, uh, again, with the risk management mind, mindset. And then one with regards to property, where do you see value in your property allocation in the fund? Uh, obviously, we don't just blanketly buy property, so maybe just clarify that. Yeah, so we, we obviously try and look for good yielding properties and then look for those that trade at a discount to their net as a value. Um, <clears throat> with what we saw in March, um, a lot of these counters are trading at very deep uh, discounts. Um, and you can understand it around the uncertainty. Properties should be as a class that take the hit given where we are in the world. Um, you know, if you're looking at our properties specifically, uh, we look for counterparties that are a niche, um, that's not necessarily uh, based on uh, retail. Um, and office space, so we like, you know, companies that focus on storage as an example, kind of cyclical, um, and also the counterparties we own have some Eastern European exposure where, you know, the impact has not been that much and it's an up and coming retail node. So you, you look for diversification, counter cyclical stocks that um, you know, protect you in times like this. Um, obviously, everyone's under pressure and we saw a sell blank or sell off, um, but there is some value in those nodes for us. Uh, thank you, Inc. I think that's uh, all we have time for now. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this session. Uh, we will be hosting another one with Bastian, who's head of our asset allocation um, team, next week. So look out for that invite. Thanks, Inc. Again, and I hope everyone has uh, found value in this session. Thanks, Inc. Thank, thank you, everyone. Cheers.